My name is Eddie O'Beng and uh, I'm guilty of bringing a wonderful speaker to us today. So I'm very proud of that. We've got Jim Dubois joining us. So we're standing at a place called View Presentation. So I'm going to just jump forward and face you because I want you to sort of really listen in as I speak. OK, so um, I'll tell you what's special about Jim. Uh, I met Jim at a, a conference which was being run by uh, TBM. So anyone here who knows about TBM, you'll know this is the real sort of cutting edge in terms of thinking and practice of getting value out of technology. And um, Jim was one of the speakers there and we had lots of speakers. But what struck me was the deep understanding of what technology is about and how it's shaping our worlds. And then the way he articulated it in such a really amusing and engaging way. Um, I know Jim is currently working as a board member of many, many corporations, and I'm sure they're really delighted to have him. I am extra delighted to have him to come and speak to us in this nice intimate setting. So Jim, thank you very much for joining us. Everybody, round of applause, Jim Dubois. Wow, thank you, Eddie. My pleasure. The, uh, My pleasure. So, uh, let me just start with a, a quick story. And, and this is about six years ago now, a little over six years ago, I was working at Microsoft um, in the IT department and had talked with my boss, the CIO, about you know career plan and what I wanted to do next, which was to go back to the product teams. Um, and one day I was uh, just coming back from a meeting and I, I got a phone call and it was from the administrative assistant to Kevin Turner, who at the time was the COO and about half of Microsoft reported to him. So not somebody that you get a, a, a call from often. And his admin said, um, can you come to Kevin's office right now? Of which I said, yes, of course. Um, and and asked her, you know, can, can you tell me what, what this is about? And, and she just said, I'll, he'll tell you when you get here. And the, the thought, yeah, the thoughts going through my head at the moment of, of uh, you know, what, what did I do? What did I screw up this time? Um, just on the way over to his office was uh, interesting. But when I got there, um, he, he explained that um, my my boss or CIO had uh, had a family issue and was uh, going to actually leave uh, the company to take care of his mom and that they were going to go do a global search for a, a new CIO, but he wanted me to be in the interim role uh, while um, they were doing that search and, and interim I, I thought I could handle. Um, it wasn't something that I wanted to do, but uh, it wasn't like I really had a choice. Um, but I, I did a quick tour around the company, talking to different people about what what, what I should do in the role. And it's it's always kind of interesting when you when you get a chance to be the boss. You always think about what you would do, but it, but the all the different things that people were saying that we had to do and and when we needed them, I. I quickly got a sense that there was no way that we were going to able to deliver anywhere close to people's expectations at the pace that we were going. And I tried a, a bunch of things um, with the team to reset direction, accelerate what we we're doing. And, and I just, I found that, um, you know, it wasn't that people weren't listening, but we, we just, we weren't going at the pace that we needed to, we weren't making progress. And I was struggling with even how to explain it. And and somebody actually on the on the team came and said, there, "There's, I just saw this TED talk of this uh, crazy British professor, and I think he's saying what you're saying about how that you know things have changed and we got to go different." It turned out that that was Eddie, and the, his, his whole uh, you know life after midnight. Um, which my first thought was, you know, what's the rating on that video? Uh, but it, I had I, once I watched it, I was, I, I, I did 
I loved what he was saying, and I, I played the, the TED Talk for my whole team, and I, you know, we started trying to figure things out, but, it, but uh, basically, I was trying to figure out how do we go faster, and, and I'll just say that, it, that the world has changed a lot in the last six years, but even then, the pace of change was going fast, and, and just very quickly, Everybody knows, and I'm not going to try to explain this chart. It was some research at MIT. But if you're transforming faster, the, the horizontal axis and, and engaging with your customers better, the, ver the vertical accents, although those companies are doing way better than other companies. How do we get to go at faster to, to be able to take advantage of this? And what are we going to do to keep from being disrupted? And the, there was, um, th this slide is actually from the World Economic Forum where they declared that we are now in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, it, it, it confused me a little bit what the difference was from the third to the fourth and the transition, but I looked into why they were calling it. And there were really two things. One was the pace of change and the other was the level of disruption that's happening in a bunch of companies. And I, I started thinking about just how quickly things are changing, and and just as a quick exercise, the you know think about how much your world has changed in in the last few years just using the apps on a on a mobile phone, using everything that's available on the internet, and then think of the time frame that those have come into place. I mean the the first iPhone was released just over 10 years ago. You know, that was the first app store that had these apps that we can now do, you know, find an app for anything. And it really isn't much more than 20 years ago that the internet became useful to, you know, really be able to, to do that. And if we think about how much the internet and mobile devices have completely changed our lives and how we interact, and how much change that that has been, and the fact that it's only been over 10 or 20 years, and that the pace of change is continuing to accelerate, that means we're going to see that much change again in the next five plus years, five to 10 years. And and you know, I I found we weren't ready to go at that pace. And, and had to try a bunch of different things to, to try to get the teams to go and eventually learned the hard way a bunch of lessons on how, how we could go faster, you know, without just working longer hours, but, but really change how we work to go faster. And I think that the companies that figure out how to, you know, increase their pace, you know, and, and again, not just working longer hours, but, but working completely differently. Those companies are going to be the ones that are doing the disruption. Those companies are going to be the ones that are, you know, excelling. And the ones that aren't changing and aren't learning to go faster are going to be the ones that 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 fall off. And we, we, when we think about, you know, what is going to change in in the next five to ten years, you know, I, I think. We're actually going to take a, a a breakout and and just have a quick discussion about what what do you think we need to be able to adapt to in the next five to ten years if things are going at this this fast and then we'll come back and and talk about either how we address some of those or or how we just go faster to be able to to take advantage of these. Okay, thank you, Jim. So what I'd like you to do, just to pick up on this question, is if you could join me at the large workshop whiteboard. I'll bring up some partitions. OK, I can see some people joining. And if you're not here yet, I'm going to drag you. So Lana, don't go yet. Sorry for dragging you back. I think you, you got it. So you see your first name. If you click on the sign where it says first name, A to H, I to L, M to Z, 
one of us will join you. So Eddie, you go to the first one. Well, we'll do as, as it is. So Simon, go to M to Z. I'll go to I to L. Okay. And we can move forward. Like so what I'm going to do is I'll quickly go through one person per group to share. We'll start with ours and give the other groups time to think. So perhaps Keith, you can start, and then someone from Simon's group, and then someone from Eddie's. Okay, we definitely decided we wanted fewer flashing lights, I think. <laughs> uh, so I think there are a couple of things we we uh, naturally focus on the negative side, and we talk quite a bit about uh, the fact that people today don't seem to look in beneath the surface too much superficiality people aren't willing to understand detail before making their minds up um uh we decided that one of the things we wish uh, actually when we say we decided i put up a, a, a post <laughs> that said we had too many project managers but um uh no doubt i've upset a lot of people already um i'm trying to think of some of the other key takeaways were more time. I mean, lots of people talk about more time. Um, anybody else in the group who has anything I've left off? Joe, anything? Um, I, th I think the, the more time is one thing. I think part of it is about what are we wasting time on um, and what's our time taken up with. So for me, uh, you know, in my mid 40s, uh, I learnt. Uh, sort of the the working world in the 1990s and most of us still operate that way so we're still doing you know endless emails um, sitting in endless face-to-face -face meetings still where the technology is there to be able to work more efficiently and effectively but actually most of us don't do it still so some of it for me is about how do we stop doing all of that churn activity and actually spend more time learning and being a bit more humble about what we don't know about the new and digital world so that we can actually learn to be more efficient and effective at what we do so that's my take and also um more of the systems thinking how do we how do we look at um the different kinds of tech uh, and digital that will help us to use it more holistically to deliver the change that we want to that was my view yeah, thank you we, we had jim in our group but i'll pass to him later so simon from your group Anyone? Yeah, I just uh, I just got thrown out, so I missed the end of the conversation. Um, but I, I think uh, I'll let Mark talk about the data side of things. I think there's definitely um, uh, uh, you know getting on top of data management is critical to being able to move at pace. Um, but we talked about the fact that some of the current large organisation uh, processes like budget annualized budgeting don't really fit with the requirement to move at pace and you know highly siloed organizations with specialisms which i think is um you know similar to the point that uh, that keith was making so uh th those would be the highlights i'd pick out mark did you want to just talk about the uh, the data side of things yeah sure um as far as the data side goes i found uh, from a hard system point of view that oftentimes there's different data sets. So if we're trying to understand a customer's set, um, there's you know as many different visions of, or views of the customer as there are data sets. And so without having any of those things. <laughs> nice. Eddie? You're later connected to understand what's happening and that slows things down because you're spending so much time just trying to find the information rather than actually digging into the information. Uh, and I think, Mark, a low, a low confidence in whether what you're looking at is of a good quality. Fair. For sure. Adrian's looking after our group. Trying to, trying to. I always forget what I'm going to say when I'm last in the queue. So there is an advantage to having A as my first letter of my name. Um, I, th I think we looked at some of the issues around the very physical, practical side of technology and hardware and things um, and the resources needed to support that. And then on the, the softer side around um, people having the 
ability to, to make the choices and decisions and to just get on with things, be a bit bolder, a bit braver and do the things that need to be done. And I, I didn't quite, I, I lost a wee bit of audio when uh, there was a bit of a conversation as well around us sometimes having almost advanced a bit too far at the cost of the resources of the planet and whatnot. So trying to balance that as well is really important so that we don't just strip the place bare for the sake of progress, I think was maybe the message, unless the person who said that wants to jump in and correct me. Chris? No, Adrian, that's exactly what I was saying. We've Perhaps we've evolved beyond our existence. Oh, in that case, we need AI. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so in order to, to, to see where we're going next, because, you know, Jim has put together some options. I'm going to pass it over to you, Jim. Any comments before we proceed? Yeah, this, this is it, this is a hard problem because things are moving so fast. The, the and the technology is advancing sometimes faster than we can keep up with. But but I think that from a working at pace, it's changing how work is the thing that's going to help the most. It's more on the on the people side. Um, at, at this point in the conversation, that usually we've either gotten off on, you know, what's get, what's going to be happening with artificial intelligence, and then some of the concerns around the, the ethical questions related to that, or we really want to talk about how do we go faster. So we, we've actually queued up this this question to see what people would uh, like to spend the next few minutes on, on um, so that we can best tailored to what you're interested in. OK, so they are voting. Everybody had a chance to vote. Let's see the results. So if we can all go to the small discussion board. Oh, we have a winner. Oh, big time winner. So we don't care about AI, Jim. There's lessons no, nobody, for going nobody faster. Cares, nobody cares about <laughs> ethics, uh, Leah. <laughs> <laughs> not, in, not in this group, anyway. It's all those years of working in the city, Simon. That's what it is. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So, so Jim, I think we can we can go with you know the the lessons for going faster. Yes. Um, I'll make sure we have the right slides set up. So, if you can all join us at the uh, view presentation. I have to say, I'm very impressed, Jim, that you have two presentations and you're flexible enough to jump between them. That is just seriously cool. Well, I've done I've done them both multiple times, so it just it, it, it's based on the questions that people are asking. So this this first one I think you've seen Eddie on the the pace of change when I talk about this and actually it, it's what I wrote my book on and the the book just quickly was also an exercise in in pace. I, I figured if I was going to talk about the lessons on being able to to work at the at the or to thrive at the pace of change that the world's going, that I couldn't use one of the, the old legacy publishing companies. So I found a startup that had built a, a publishing company on top of the Amazon self-publishing service where they had editors and marketing people that didn't have to have any of the publishing infrastructure and they all worked in an agile fashion so the, there was no uh, big project and anything but the one of the, the biggest things they did for me was they pushed the this uh, focus on getting things concise and they got all of the, the lessons that I wanted to tell down to chapters that they had me summarize in six words and then lessons within the chapters that they had me summarize each lesson in just six words. This presentation, I've actually summarized the 100 lessons of the book into four lessons. Um, so th these are the things that, that, that must change. And the first one is the, the culture. And, and what, what I found when I was trying to push things forward was if we didn't have a culture that supported the change and supported the pace, that the culture was going to hold everything back no matter what else we did. So talking about how do we purposely set a culture that will enable change, that uh, when we ask people to do something, they won't think in their head, 
if I get that I'm being asked to do this, but I know how I get recognized and put my how my performance is evaluated, so I'm not going to do what I'm being asked because that doesn't fit. All those things that are part of the culture that can hold us back. So I'm going to talk about how do we purposely set the culture. The second point is changing this definition of success. So if we're going to go faster, we've got to go in the right direction or it's, it's uh, just not effective. And the third point is just modernize how we work. We've, you know, pe people have made a couple comments about, you know, just being able to leverage technology for meetings rather than all these face-to-face -face meetings, all the emails, all this, but completely changing how we work. And that includes the point that somebody said about we have too many project managers. Because in the old way of working where we, you know, defined the, the goal of a project, we figured out all the scope that we were going to accomplish and we built a schedule and then we resourced the plan and then and then we started working. By that time, we oftentimes at the pace things are going, the plans changed and we're already too late. But if we work that way. So we have to completely modernize how we work. In the software industry, this is called Agile, but we can apply it to, to everything. And then beyond that, number four is, is my, my summary for all the other lessons, which are just find the things that are slowing you down and the things that are creating friction and, and eliminate them. So I'm going to go through each of, each of these points one at a time, uh, hopefully relatively quickly and have a chance to talk about them. So setting the culture is something that is really hard to change, especially in big companies, but it, it's, it's as big a problem in small companies as it is in big companies. And there's three things that you have to do to, to change the culture. The, the first one is just purposely define what you want the culture to look like. And that includes what you don't want it to look like anymore, things that exist in your current culture um, that, that you want to uh, change and eliminate. And er every company is going to have a, a little bit different um, you know, values and, and uh, uh, culture traits, but I, I would recommend a few that you really want to make sure that you have from this pace. And the, one of them is about uh, a really developing a learning culture as opposed to a culture that thinks they have everything figured out already. Uh, Satya Nadella at Microsoft gave all the execs in the company a book called Mindset by uh, Dr. Carol Dweck from Stanford. And that mindset talks about this learning mindset, or she calls it a growth mindset, um, is super important as part of a cultural element in, in being able to move quickly. The another thing that you want to think about is your your tolerance around risk and, and risks is is absolutely something that we need to think about. But in the old world, it was something that we tried to eliminate. And in the new world, we need actually to be better at managing risk so that we can take on more risk so that we can go faster. And if we're better at managing risk, then then we're able to to take on that that more risk to go faster. Um, another element is, um, and we, we at Microsoft use the word inclusion, but it's really this, we, we need to be able to hear from all of the different diverse perspectives to make sure that our, our view of success that we're going has, has uh, everybody's input. Um, so the, that in, inclusive uh, piece is another part of the culture. The last example I'll use is uh, being data driven. So we we really tried to develop a culture that was based on using data to make decisions, and and really this is taking the the politics and personal influence out of decision making and and trying to use data for it. And data isn't always uh, available, but you can define a hypothesis and 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 the an experiment and, and measure data and collect data as part of that to be able to move forward. So those are just some example traits that you want to have in the culture. But just defining those isn't enough. You, you need then for the leaders to start modeling those 
those traits. And it, it, it ha is something that Satya Nadella at Microsoft actually spent some time teaching other leaders how to model, and then he himself would model the, the cultural traits. And I'll, I'll give a quick example. The, uh, several years ago, Microsoft was doing a, an experiment with a bot interacting on the internet, learning some natural language processing traits, and the bot had a teenage female persona and was interacting with people. And you may have seen this in the press because it blew up on us, but the, uh, a bunch of internet trolls um, started feeding data to the bot and training the bot to be racist and cruel and she started, um, you know, saying some things that were absolutely not uh, in line with the values of, you know, I, I'll, I'll say anyone, let alone uh, us as a company. <laughs> Microsoft pulled it down right away, um, but not before the press got a hold of it. And they were having a field day with, you know, how could Microsoft let this happen? You know, who, why didn't they have better controls in place? Who, whoever did this should be fired. And I, the, the, the woman that was running the team that was doing the experiment, you know, at, right as everything was blowing up, she, she got a phone call and she could see, and I know this because I spent time talking with her about it, but she, she could see that it was Satya himself calling her. And you could imagine what she's thinking as everything's blowing up, getting a call from the CEO. <laughs> and... The actually the the first thing that that he asked was, are are you okay? You know, showing some of the empathy that he talks about in his book. But but really, his first question to her was, what did we learn? And then how how are we going to share that learning with other teams? What are we going to do different next time? Not what were you thinking? How could you let this happen? You know, not not any of the things that our old culture might have done. And and the story actually went viral within the company of you know how Satya responded to um, the the thing as a let's take this as a learning opportunity and it made such a huge difference. I had her come and talk to my team about it because I was trying to teach my team that it was okay to take risk as long as you could manage the risk and and and. Um, that we were learning from it because we need to change how we learn so that we can learn learn quickly. That's just an example of modeling. But defining the culture and then having leaders model it was was still not enough. We had to actually go through every communications process, rewards and recognition process, how performance evaluations, everything that that we did as a company and make sure it aligned to the new culture. That when you know somebody was, um, you know, recon pub doing some public recognition about something, that it reinforced the new culture, and it didn't, you know, reinforce the old culture that we were trying to change. And so there's a lot to that, but it but it was purposeful process of going about cultural change. Um, let's quickly go on to definition of success. And, and the, the graphic here kind of illustrates the point of, you know, success is, is never really a straight line. And, and there's lots of learning and things that go on on the way to, towards success. In our old way of working, recognizing maybe subconsciously that that there was all these different ways to that, that we would go to get to success we didn't really give the goals to our teams of ultimate success we would break it down and we would ask people to do um you know something that wasn't necessarily tied to real success if we're going to change how we work we actually have to change our definition of success to real success. So using the project management example, historically we've measured success for a project as delivering on time, on budget, you know, on on uh, to, you know, for what we were asked to do. 
And, and while those are fine things to measure, that they're actually not success. Success is what, what were we trying to accomplish and how are we gonna measure that? And when we delivered, did those metrics move? And if we can change how we measure success based on that, we actually get the teams themselves to start coming up with new ideas that will help us get there faster, that will help us get real success as opposed to just deliver that that particular project that may not even have the right scope anymore because of the pace of change. So we have to get that real measure of success out for, for our teams. And how we do that has to change too. Again, recognizing that we're gonna learn along the way and we need to iterate towards something as opposed to just you know try to think that we can figure out now what we need to have in two years at the pace of change that everybody's going that's just not realistic to to spend the time and if you're spending enough time to really analyze it and set those the the two-year things you you can you know almost be sure that they're not going to be right so instead of locking a plan for two years we we work in agile sprints with durable teams so that we don't have to create um, resourcing all the time and we give make sure that the teams are working on the most important thing that will get us towards true success and that they'll iterate towards that and the only thing that's locked is the current sprint plan of the next couple of weeks the the plan just beyond the current sprint is pretty well understood and the next few sprints is are, are, are relatively understood with a little bit of flexibility as we go farther out into the future they're they're less and less locked and there's more room to adjust but it's enough to help set expectations where we're going and are we making enough progress but it's a completely different way of of uh how we work and this it's the some of the some of the software teams in the world have, have started working this, but it isn't something just for a software team. Everybody can can actually work in a you know iterative approach. The this last point on helping us go faster is just looking at everything else that's creating friction, you know, and and sometimes in in my role, these were things that were viewed to be uh, very important, you know, like um, security and compliance that were creating friction. And, and what we found as addressing that friction was changing the accountabilities. You know, when we had the accountability that the security team thought that they were accountable for any issue in security in, in the company, their, their goal actually was not to help the company move faster that was to make sure that no there were no security issues and it, it it created friction between every other team so we changed the accountability and we we made sure that every team was accountable for their own security and the and the relationship with the security team changed to be one of can you help us be secure instead of the you know, how do we get around these security guys that are making us go slower? And that took the friction out of the system that that helped make everything go faster. And there's there's many examples of, of things that we could do to remove friction, but you know, maybe now would be a, a good time to have a little bit of Q&A related to, to these. these so before that. Lessons. Thank you, Jim. So just before that, I'll, I'll give some time for, so people can, you know, quickly discuss and process what you've said, and then perhaps they can come back with some questions. Would that be okay? Perfect. So if we could all go to the coffee tables. So the coffee tables, list of places, you all know how to get, and then you can, we can have two short rounds of discussions. So pick a table, do some networking, share some of your thoughts about it.
Right. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure some of you were having very good conversations. Sorry for the dragging. It's just that we have, you know, some people have other commitments. Some people are on the other side of the world in there. Thursday is just getting started. So we have a few minutes. So there were some questions for you, Jim, over in the group text chat. So there's one from from Joe. I think that's how do you get executive leadership commitment to change? It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, and this this is important because if you're gonna start by changing the culture and, and your execs aren't gonna help model the new culture that that it's not it's not gonna work. So usually what what I found is the the recognition of what's happening in the industry the pace that everybody else is going and that we're not and what we need to do to not be disrupted is, is enough motivation to get the execs to realize that they've got to do something. Then, then you can start with, okay, here's the things that we've got to do to be able to go at the pace that's going to allow us to be successful relative to our you know, competitors. Okay. Um, there's one. Is it possible for large, complex organizations to become truly agile? Absolutely. You, you got to get a culture in place first that's going to support it and, and help you go faster and, and get the right measures of success. If, if you just try to be agile without those, it, it's going to be really hard. And it will be more complex for the the large complex organizations and you can experiment within a division or or some subsection of the company and learn from that but it, it is possible okay there was, there was a hundred and twenty thousand people in microsoft hmm. and and people will say yeah sure they're the software company but there were lots of parts of the company that were just like most big companies that that weren't in software development that needed to change there's one from how would you modernize the way people collaborate? Uh, the first of all, the intent in meetings has to change. There's a great book by Patrick Lencioni called Death by Meetings that I, I would <laughs> I would start with looking at. The and I would certainly use Cube to leverage how do we include people from all over the world. <laughs> from a from a from a technology perspective, so that you, you can't ha you can't rely on in you know face to face meetings that are these kinds of meetings that are conducted like we used to do. So I would use Patrick Lencioni's book on death by meetings on how to redo how to even think about meetings and and leverage the technology to get people from everywhere. Okay, so there's one final one. Is it every reasonable to leave some of the really reluctant, stubborn members out of organizations behind when it comes to needing rapid change? Yes. <laughs> Good. It, it, and it, it is part of the culture change that that I, you know, I didn't go into much, but the people that are just going to fight the culture, that you, You've got to help them find something different to do. Nice. OK, so before we do our final spin, if we, uh, if we could all join the place called learning, it would be great if we could get some learning from today. I mean, it's been a lot of new things. So a list of places, learning, I see some people joining, and everybody seems to be here now. OK, so use your stickies. You can keep capture, I don't know, what was your surprise today or what have you learned? How can you use it in the future? Any of those threes or all of them? Go for it. And Mark, we'll start with you then. So we can start from you and go down the list. OK, uh, as far as uh, learning, the one thing that Jim had mentioned when we were doing a breakout was like identifying the, ch the culture Correct me if I'm wrong or butchering this, Jim, but identifying the cultural traits that would slow down um, the ability to 
to become speedy and agile and those things uh, through the things that people care about, the way they reward uh, people, the way they incentivize people, um, and then and start working on the cultural component um, right away. So I thought it was a really great insight. Great stuff. Thank you, Mark. I know you have to run. Your your day's just getting started. Thank you very much. Um, Jim, I think you're on the list, but before that, I think you deserve lots of applause. So I'm standing up. You can all give your applause to Jim and thank him for today. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any final thoughts, Jim? The uh, I, I will say culture is just just critical. It's the place to start. The the getting the CEO on board is is important, but it it you you can have some bottoms up effort to it that, that will help get the CEO on board or help get the the leader on board. So it doesn't have to start with the, the CEO. You just get, getting them to help model is going to help make it go faster. So I wish everybody success in everything they're working on. Eddie, any final words? Yes, I just want to say a massively huge, enormous thank you to Jim. I, I knew it was going to be brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, I think the lessons were great. I was so impressed by your flexibility by the about the two presentations and the way you sort of took us through the sort of no holds barred stories of uh, leaders teaching yourself having to lead and step into the role of CIO. I, I, I'm just so pleased and so grateful. Thank you very much. Everyone, please join me in a round of applause. Just to say a big thank you to Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Press space bar to jump if you're happy about it. Thank you, Jim, Yay. and everybody. Have a good evening for those of you who are in the evening. Have a good day, those of you who are just getting started.